Hey everybody, welcome back to our study in Jonah. Thank you so much for making this journey with me. Let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to be in chapter 3 today, and we'll finish it up, and then we'll do two more sessions in chapter 4. So if you've got your Bible, turn to Jonah chapter 3, and we're going to begin at verse 6 and read out through the end of the chapter and talk a little bit about it. So here's where we are. Uh, Jonah obeys the word of the Lord. It comes to him a second time. And he ends up going to Nineveh, and God's message is this, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's verse 4 of Jonah chapter 3. And then you read this remarkable thing that we talked about in our last session, verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. Not Jonah, but they believed God. There's power in God's word. And so what happens is a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. So that's where we find ourselves. We've got this incredible revival because of the power of the word of God. Now, verse 6, if you're looking along with me, says, When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. I've got to stop there and just tell you, uh, in some ways that hits me as a bit humorous, a little bit sad, because what have the animals done? But they're involved in the repentance. It's so widespread. Everything, including the animals, are repenting. Uh, verse 8 says, but let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent with compassion, turn from his fierce anger, so that we will not perish. And then verse 10 says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. Some translations say he repented and did not bring on them the, the destruction he had threatened. Okay, let's talk a little bit about that, what we read about. So we have this great revival, um, and Nineveh now is in a state of repentance. The king down through all the people, as we said, all the animals, everybody is in sackcloth and ashes, which is a sign of repentance and saying, we're sorry, God. We want to turn from our evil ways. You know, Nineveh was described as an exceedingly evil place. And so they're repenting. They believe the message of God. And what does God do? He responds to them in loving kindness. Now, I want to say that sometimes God's love doesn't look like love to us. I want you to think about that for just a moment. You know, that's not limited just to God. Sometimes with a parent, you know, a child will say to a parent, you don't love me. And I can tell you, having heard that from my two boys on more than one occasion, um, if you don't understand that it's coming from the mouth of a child, or somebody who doesn't understand, that can be really painful. You don't love me because, honestly, at that moment, under those circumstances, if you're having to discipline them or do some hard work in their lives, then they honestly don't believe that you love them because they have an understanding of love that is not complete. Sometimes God has to love us with what has been known as tough love. So it doesn't come across in a definition or in a way that we often like to think of love. Sometimes, as is the case in Jonah chapter 3, God's love came across to the Ninevites in stinging judgment. God had finally had it with these people, their brutality, their godlessness. And so he comes to them through this, again, wayward prophet, and, and the message is, you guys need to get right. You need to clean your act up. You need to repent, or I'm going to destroy you. 
Is that love? Honestly, if you just heard it that way, is that love? And what I want to tell you is, the answer is, yes. Yes. The reason God brought that message through Jonah to the Ninevites is because he loved them. He loved them. Love has to have moral structure to it. Do we really love somebody if we don't care about their moral well-being? I guess another way uh, to put it is, do we really love somebody if we don't care about how they live? How they treat not only themselves, but how they treat other people. If, if we kind of have an attitude that says, well, whatever, you know, it's none of my business or I don't want to get involved, are we really loving people? Now, I'm not arguing that a lot in our world today, and let's be honest about it, even in the Christian kingdom, a lot of us have absorbed that concept of love, but is that actually really loving people? Let me share a verse from the New Testament with you. Uh, I, I love this verse, but I will tell you, it's not going to sound exactly the way you might have preconceived it to sound like. Here's what I mean by that. For the grace of God. Okay, so I say the grace of God. Paul writes, for the grace of God. What is your immediate thought? The grace of God. Well, listen. Paul says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It, talking about the grace of God, teaches us to say no. Did you catch that? That's where I think our concept of the grace of God may kind of run head first into this idea that saying no, that's not a part of the grace of God. We associate yes with the grace of God. Well, part of the grace of God is yes, but part of the grace of God, according to Paul here in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, involves no. And so, verse 12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. You see what's being said there? God's love, God's grace, not only says yes, but at times it says no, and it says no to living immorally you got to live the right way. That's what it's teaching us to do. And I'm simply saying that when God comes to Nineveh and he comes with a really hard message because they are living godlessly, the reason he's there is because he loves them. Somebody said that there is a terror of grace. You get that terror of grace. Um, you announce you're going to do something because you want them to turn. And I, I believe, and I want you to think about this, that the reason God sent Jonah to Nineveh with the message, 40 days, and if you don't turn, uh, I'm going to destroy the place. I believe the reason, and I want you to listen to this, that God sent Jonah there was because he wanted those people to turn. And so he turns the heat up on them because he wants them to change. Again, because he loves them. And I'm going to say this as a practical note. I don't believe that you and I can have loving relationships with other people. Whether it's in a marriage, with your children, with your parents, friendships, within a church, I don't think you can have loving relationships without at times having 
hard conversations. I think those are evidences that we love each other. Do you remember when Paul confronted Peter? And, and it literally says he confronted him to the face and said to Peter, you are in the wrong. In our lingo today, he would have said, brother, I love you, but you are doing wrong. And you've got to change. Now, why would Paul have that conversation? Why would he take that risk with Peter? Because he loved Peter. He wanted what was best for him. So, at the end in verse 10, and I I love this. Let's read it again. When God saw what they did, you know, they, they put on sackcloth and ashes, and they're repenting, and they're doing all this saying, who knows, maybe God will change his mind. Maybe he'll see that our hearts are changing. He'll see our actions, and he won't destroy us. And then it says, when God saw, God did see them, what they did and how they turned from their evil ways. Uh, The New International Version that I'm reading from says he relented. But I, I said earlier, some translations use the word repented. It's the same idea. But it's interesting, isn't it? that God would repent. Obviously, we associate that word, that concept with us, not with God. But if you understand that the word repent literally means to change your mind. So it says, he relented, he repented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Now, real quickly, can I just say this? Some of you are thinking and saying, well, wait a minute. God changed his mind. God repented. I thought the Bible said that God doesn't change. You know, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is that way. And that's true. God has never broken a promise. Who God is doesn't change. Let me say this about verse 10. You have to understand it from the standpoint of his relationship with us and in particular with the Ninevites and where God says 40 days and then I'm going to destroy you he was looking for them to change and so because they changed God saw that then God changed his plan and did not bring destruction does God change Not in his nature, but does God change based on our relationship with him? Absolutely. When you think about prayer, prayer can change God. Prayer makes a difference. And here in this case, repentance can change God when he sees that we have changed. It has to do with our relationship. So that gets us through chapter 3. We will pick it up in the next two sessions in chapter 4 and finish out this thrilling story. Have a great day and thanks for joining.